Good morning, friends. 34 years ago, I preached my first sermon jointly with my friend Giles in the school chapel. It was truly dreadful. It wasn't just awful because it had been created by two 16-year-old boys who didn't have a clue what they were doing. Far worse, it was dreadful in content. In the sermon, I still have a copy, we argued that Christianity was true because of the evidence of contemporary healing miracles. An American evangelist had been holding a rally in Brighton. A blind woman had allegedly been miraculously healed at one of his meetings. Her story was the climax of our sermon. And our message was this, believe in Jesus and he will make your life wonderful. Health and happiness will be yours. Wealth and plenty will be your lot. We didn't know it, but we were preaching the so-called prosperity gospel. Name it and claim it, and every blessing will be yours now. But a week or two later, the apparent healing was exposed as bogus, and the evangelist as a money-grabbing fraud. For my friend Giles, that was the end of his Christianity. Having once dragged his friends, me included, to listen to video messages from American televangelists, he became cynical and hostile towards all things Christian. It still makes me wince when I think of it. I've repented of my part in that sermon. Now, like all heresy, the prosperity gospel is half true. God can do miracles if he chooses. Certainly we see a thousand evidences of his providential kindness every day. Moreover, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will receive the most fantastic treasure, you will one day be healed. You will be rich beyond your dreams. You'll be happier than you ever considered possible. You will become for all eternity the person your creator intended you to be. But not yet. Not in this world. Not now. No, that is the character of the new heavens and the new earth. The resurrection age. The age to come, as Jesus called it. That's where the so-called prosperity gospel short circuits the biblical gospel. God's gospel could be better described as the adversity now and prosperity later gospel. That's true, but it's not very concise. But then we're in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, so being concise isn't really a concern. But with God's gospel, however many miracles we see, crucifixion must come before resurrection. However many providential acts of kindness the Lord does. Suffering must come before glory. It was so for King Jesus, and as for the King, so for his people. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we become God's child. That's why we pray to our Father in heaven. And if that is so, then as Paul says in Romans 8, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And that experience of hope-transfigured suffering is one of the themes that runs throughout this magnificent psalm. And so our psalmist helps us when suffering comes to us. This is how God's word sustains us, by sanctifying us, drawing us onward and deeper into our union with Jesus Christ. Let me read just a few verses of the psalm this morning from verses 67 through to 72. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. It was good for me to be afflicted, so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. The unbeliever tells us that this is impossible, but in the same breath, the psalmist can tell us that he is afflicted, but that his God is good. The arrogant have compounded his sufferings. They smear him with lies. Their hearts are callous. There's no sympathy from them. And yet his faith does not falter. Indeed, isn't his testimony breathtaking? 
Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. His testimony is that God used suffering to teach him true obedience. He sees his loving Lord at work through the very heartache that he has allowed into his life. Even the Lord Jesus, the beloved Son of his Father, learned obedience from what he suffered. As for the King, so it will be for us. So can we say with the psalmist, as we reflect on our affliction or prepare for the affliction to come, a serious illness, a deep anxiety, a broken heart, whatever it may be, can we say to the Lord in faith, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees? Far from doubting God's love, that is where we see it at work. Well, it would be extraordinary, except I've heard it too many times over the years from so many sisters and brothers at St John's. In reality, it is often only in affliction that God's word has come to life, that faith has taken deep roots in God alone, and that resurrection hope has become the firm anchor for the soul that it was always designed to be. Sanctify them by the truth, Jesus prayed. Your word is truth. Are we ready to be sanctified through suffering? Or take heart, it will be the discovery of the goodness of God and his word. And in sharing with Christ's sufferings, we are on a pathway to sharing with him in his glory. And that is a prosperity worth holding out for. Let's pray. Father, some of us watching this are conscious of our own afflictions. And some of us are conscious of the afflictions of those we love. Defend us, we pray, from callous hearts, arrogant minds, lying lips. Have mercy upon us. Open our eyes to your goodness and the goodness of your providential ordering of our lives. And grant that we may say in faith, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.